We've had quite uh, this morning already an emphasis on the economy, on things financial. We've talked to Nicola Willis um, about the fiscal update and very uh, importantly the merger of TVNZ and RNZ, which is not cheap. Uh, we've had David Seymour on. And really to wrap up the year economically, a guy who has provided some really interesting ideas and input uh, here on the platform for you to listen to and has informed my view of the New Zealand economy and New Zealand uh, economic policy, uh, Eric Crap Crampton, who is the New Zealand Initiative Chief uh, Economist uh, and I think he's just survived some sort of uh, fire alarm, though he looks all right uh, on the video. Eric, uh, welcome uh, to the platform uh, once more. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Good morning, Sean. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we had a little fire drill even right at the time I was supposed to be coming on with you, but that's all right. Well, that we all went down us, the stairs, well I don't know. Up. I blame you all now. Good. I blame you now for knowing more about Zelensky's interpreter and his inability to be gripping um, than I did before. I'm not going to hold it against you. Uh, yeah. Eric. No, we, I, I missed the talk. Yeah, Eric, we, we end this year with predictions and indeed policies set by a Reserve Bank which seem designed to drive the country into recession uh, midway through next year and, and during the election n next year. And I don't know, there seems to be a feeling that we may be paying the price for some policy settings during covid and those policies are now impacting on everyday uh, New Zealanders. Should everything be doom and gloom when we think economically at the moment or not? Um, but, um, maybe not for the long term. Uh, in the long term, there's been some really interesting technological progression. Uh, AI is advancing faster than we were expecting. Chat AI has been really good. Some advances in nuclear fusion that look really promising. Uh, the latter is not really going to pan out to, to anything for New Doesn't Zealand next matter, year. Doesn't matter a jot to me if I've got to pay five hundred dollars <laughs> extra a fortnight on my mortgage, Eric. Well, next year is going to be a little grim. So the, the old the saying that's been on Twitter for some time: uh, "Mess around and find out." Well, that was kind of late twenty twenty through all of twenty twenty one was the messing around phase, and now we're we've been in the find out phase, and that's gonna that's gonna hit a little harder next year. So the initial response to COVID. I think was great. We managed to stamp it out. That enabled us to have a more successful economic recovery. It meant that New Zealand school kids had less time out of school than those in a lot of other places that had kind of longer dragging out uh, quasi lockdowns that didn't do very much. But the rest of government policy responded as though we were going to be having a sharp recession because of COVID. That meant that they overstimulated the economy both on the fiscal side and on the monetary side and they failed to reverse course with any kind of alacrity and they well they've not reversed course at all on the fiscal side the reserve bank has turned around finally this was worrying me all the way through 2022 and from part of 2021 where one of the most important resources that any reserve bank has is its credibility and the trust that it that it generates that it will get inflation back on track so, so long as everybody trusts that that's going to happen, the Reserve Bank will have a little bit more flexibility in responding to conditions as it sees appropriate, because everyone knows that it'll get back to 2% inflation, so they don't start negotiating for 8% wage increases, for example. And they trust them. Example. And they fundamentally trust them. Yeah. And that started breaking down under Adrian Orr. He seemed to be distracted by every other shiny policy thing that had no nothing to do with the Reserve Bank, took his eye off of inflation and monetary policy failed to get it back on track quickly enough. And now there's actually risk of overshooting in uh, where, where the Reserve Bank has to not just fight inflation, but also fight the impression that it created about itself as not caring very much about inflation over the past year and a half. Mm. Uh, look, Eric, there's the background and the run up. Now we're in a situation where Adrian Orr is saying, tighten your belts. Well, you've got no choice if the mortgage is going up and you want to have a, a roof over your head. But I guess that message also applies to the government. The consistent message oh, I've, I've been getting from inside the bureaucracy is, geez, we've spent a lot of money for not much gain, not much benefit. And now we are looking at policies like the TVNZ, RNZ merger saying, is that a, a, a nice to have or a must have? Do you believe this government and how, I mean, for example, would axing that policy 
with a say, I imagine they spend 150 mil already and not spending, say, $600 million, is that going to have any real benefit to the economy if the government were to go through a line-by-line -line exercise and really tighten its belt? Well, a line-by-line -line review really should focus in the areas where there's the most uh, labour market pressure. So over the past year, the government continued with stimulus policies aimed at the construction sector that had been started in 2020 when they were fearing this big bust and there wasn't going to be any investment in infrastructure or in building. So they progressed projects like a $50 million spend on some Auckland film studios. Like every one of the workers that was pulled into that could have been working on something useful like building houses, building roads, building pipes, building critical infrastructure kit that we've been lacking for some time. Going through line by line, it's not just the money, right? Because money, well, Reserve Bank prints more of it. Uh, you can raise more of it in taxes. It's the real resources, right? They have been drawing real resources out of productive parts of the economy and throwing it into a blender that's just doing no good at all. And they, they would literally have done better by burning the money that they used to fund the Auckland Film Studio upgrade, for example, because at least that would have helped to fight inflation. Instead, it was pulling workers out of productive activities into things that are fundamentally useless because they only support a subsidized industry that can only exist at its current scale because of massive subsidies, right? right. Going through line by line so on, and on looking that, for that kind that of On that era, you could yeah. say the news media are the same. We should have burnt the money rather than put it in the public interest journalism fund. Well, you can at least make a public interest case for um, a better informed public, right? It's not crazy. And it's better to do it out of tax revenues than standover tactics on Google and, pla and uh, Facebook, right? So yeah. they've got, Willie Jackson's been proposing this platform regulation legislation following Australia and Canada's example. Uh, those who are interested in it should really read Michael Geist. He's a professor at the University of Toronto who's gone through the Canadian legislation and some pernicious implications for free speech and for well, media in general where you're... It, you're ba breaking fundamental principles of the internet in order to break parts of how the media work. And yeah. none of that makes sense. One fundamental principle of the internet is that you don't pay to link. Anybody is free to link and anybody is also free to put a robots.txt disclaimer on their website so that, browse, so that uh, Google and Facebook can't index it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's how the web has worked since it got going. Now it's turning into a pay to link because well, folks like the spinoff want to suck money out of Google and Facebook. Yeah, yeah. They're paying me at the moment, or they're playing the platform because they get so many views on their Facebook pages. I quite like that. It's not a lot of money. Yeah. But it's better than a poke in the well, eye that was the one of the that was one of the conclusions of a report by Saperi that was commissioned by the Ministry for Culture and Heritage, where they were asked to look at the effects of, of platforms on news media. And the conclusion was that they're helpful that it drives traffic, drives revenue, and the, if anything is beneficial, not harmful. Yeah. So they've turned around and decided to beat them up for it. As long as you're making content that there is a public, um, that there is a public uh, appetite for. So, Eric, there is nothing we can do, essentially, to stop the recession that is coming next year, right? Well, yeah, it's pretty going to be... It, you don't get out of inflationary episodes like this without a recession, except you'd have to be really, really lucky, right? So you'd have to have some confluence of, of events that would work to bring inflation down quickly enough that the Reserve Bank could reverse course. Mm. Uh, so if the exchange rate went up considerably because of the Reserve Bank's actions and then imported inflation went down considerably because price of all imports went down, that could be one thing. Um, was a yes or no? It happened. was a yes or no question, Eric. Is there any way, really? No, I, I, no. Not, not really. No. Okay. Um, then what can the government do? And I'm thinking in a political sense here. So we've got an election, no, November, probably next year, and we're going to be in the middle of this recession. That, that, okay, fundamentally is unavoidable. What can it do in its budget next year? And we're going to get a hint, I guess, today of what that might look like. What possibly then can an incumbent government do to stop people hurting? Or does it pick a few people it wants to sway to stay with it and splurge a whole lot of money on them? I guess it depends whether 
Labour sees there as being any chance of forming government after this election. If it thinks that it has a chance of forming government after this election, it might want to avoid causing huge problems for itself the subsequent year, in which case you might expect better policy. If instead they're expecting very little chance of forming government and that they need to be targeting policy to shore up their base and ensure that the most committed party supporters actually turn up to vote, which they didn't do in Hamilton, then we can expect some terrible policy that would cause problems for whoever forms government at the end of 2023. So more sensible policy, you would want to be inflation indexing the tax threshold so it stops having this kind of ratchet. You'd want to be having a line by line review of spend. You would probably want to be boosting health spend where we're expecting that, well, we can obviously see the shortages now. That is not going to get better as long COVID cases start mounting and it you keep seeing worrying research reports that COVID actually reduces people's immune systems so you're more susceptible to RSV and everything else. That means that the burden on the health system over the next few years is going to be worse. So you would expect that a labor government would be happier to maybe inflation index the tax thresholds but not undo a lot of the prior drift from inflation and then put the money instead into bolstering health services fixing the immigration system so that that could actually so the health system could expand would be great they were very late in allowing nurses to apply for residence but the problems are broader than that uh if they're bringing in partners there's still going to be problems in getting visas uh sorting out that mess will be important labor has tended to view migrants as stealing jobs from kiwis and just putting more pressure on the housing market it's a bit short-sighted where migrant labor is often a strong complement to the labor of locals. So all the international literature tends to expect that when you get more migrants in, it actually, if anything, it does provides a small boost to the wages for locals. It's pretty small effects either way, but migrants help their complements to local labor rather than substitutes for it, and it lets the whole boat move faster. Uh, sorting that out would be wonderful. I worry instead that we're going to be hitting the kind of election where they are trying to shore up support and that there will be reckless spending initiatives that are just targeted at um, enthusing a demographic that would vote for them and doesn't really see the consequences. And I guess we get an indication, uh, Eric, today of, of that. And I think you've summed up very well what the choices are come budget time and, and how the Labour Party or the government is fear, feeling about itself will be obvious by budget time next year when we look and we analyse what their spending is. I trust you'll be doing that with us. I trust you are having a break after quite an intense year. Are uh, you getting away? Are you getting yeah. out of the country? Oh, I'm not getting out of the country. Uh, my parents have finally gotten into the country. First time that they've seen the grandkids since uh, 2020. Wow. So Kids have grown up here a bit in the, in the interim, so we're having a bit. Of, we're going to have a summer with them. Um, have a happy uh, holidays, uh, Eric. Thank you very much indeed for all your uh, erudite observations and your availability to the platform uh, during the year. I wish you and your colleagues at the initiative all the best. And same to you. It's been great chatting. Thank you. That is Eric Crampton, chief economist uh, for the uh, New Zealand Initiative um, and a regular contributor here on the platform in the course of the last uh, few months.